Huizhen. Uh, our next speaker is Huizhen Zhou from UC Davis. We're going to continue on the theme of avians, but um, now uh, talk about um, functional annotation, I, uh, I think, and, um, and also coming from the perspective of uh, now the USDA and um, uh, agriculture as well. All right. Thanks for the uh, invitation and uh, it's my great honor to share the, some of the recent data generated from the uh, fan community. And uh, I really like to uh, switch uh, the gear from uh, DNA sequencing to the epigenome and uh, regular animals, uh, uh, what the, the regulatory evolution uh, in a vertebrate actually. This is uh, my first attempt to try to do in the comparative genomics. So I'm not really in the area of the comparative genomics. So. Uh, uh, so I tried to uh, give some of the specific uh, examples about what are we learning about uh, comparative uh, epigenome. Uh, for the people who are not familiar with the cultural species, I'd like to uh, provide some of the little background about the cultural species. Uh, chicken actually is the first, uh, you know, cultural species was sequenced in 2004 because uh, for the people in the comparative genomics know that Chicken is really important uh, if you look at the evolution uh, pe uh, uh, phenogenetic tree. So it's a really important uh, uh, evolution uh, point. And then uh, later on, the cow and uh, uh, the horse in 2009 and pig in 2012 and sheep in 2014. Since uh, you know those uh, agricultural species were sequenced, uh, there's a significant uh, uh, improvement uh, in the uh, economic important traits because of those information available to you. So the community use uh, genomic selection and make a significant improvement of those complex traits, uh, such as milk production, growth rate, uh, feed efficiency, and disease. And then uh, if you uh, think about uh, for the livestock, uh, cultural species really have lots of advantage if you think about the uh, those livestock species have really abundant of the phenotype in different environment, and they have a really good uh, pedigree information. So you really can utilize those uh, phenotype and then use the genotype to predict the uh, phenotype. And then, uh, so the animals basically, if you try to think about uh, personalized medicine in the, uh, in the biomedical field, so really animal can be raised, uh, you know, in a really different type of environment or control environment. So you can really evaluate uh, uh, genotype by environment. So you can really accurately predict the phenotype. So you can really evaluate like uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs in terms of, uh, you know, what type of uh, drug uh, uh, can be a uh, uh, really treat different type of uh, disease. Uh, so livestock species uh, really great model uh, to for us to understand uh, the, you know, uh, the function of the specific genes. And then because all of those, uh, uh, you know, complex traits are uh, very important, and, uh, we know the, the contribution of these, uh, it's not just the, the coding genes, actually the majority of these uh, contributions by the non-coding variants, so there's many of the studies, many of the GWAS study in the biomedical field that demonstrate that the non-coding uh, variants are very, very important uh, for the contribution of the phenotypic uh, variation in complex traits, including the disease. And then, uh, and the reason of the study in both of the human and uh, livestock uh, uh, do indicate uh, you know, the, those causative uh, variants that are enriched in the regional regions. And then we know uh, for whatever highly conserved those regular elements such as enhancer, all recently involved those the enhancers have, do have different uh, phenotypic consequence. So that's why important to uh, doing the comparative epigenomics to learning about uh, which kind of the uh, regular elements are more highly conserved or recently involved. Uh, as we can see for the biomedical field, uh, the people uh, integrate of the genome-wide association uh, results with uh, the annotation from ANCODE or root map of the epigenome uh, really provide a novel uh, biological insights about the complex traits in humans, including uh, human disease. 
So basically, whatever from the biomedical field or you know, uh, the cultural and all the National Science Foundation, most important things uh, is talk about how we can use the genome, uh, genome to predict the phenome. So that's actually it's a black, block, uh, black box uh, between the genome and the phenome. And uh, what that is the black box is actually gene regulation. So that's how the, those uh, regular elements play a very, very important role. Uh, and from this uh, diagram, you can see basically that they involve lots of the regular elements such as a promoter, enhancer, uh, insulator, silencer, all of the together to basically form those complex regulators of the gene uh, regulation. And many of you guys are familiar with this diagram from ANCOR to talk about uh, uh, utilize those uh, uh, cutting edge of the omics technology in order to uh, uh, identify, annotate those uh, regular elements, whatever, it's a promoter, enhancer, you know, evaluate all the uh, chromatin accessibility to understanding the function of the genome. So comparative genomics really provide uh, really uh, powerful tools uh, uh, to understand its function and biology based on the assumption of that connection between evolution of the conservation and uh, the functional importance. So we think if there are uh, functionally, uh, if they are evolutionally conserved, that must be a very, very functional important. And then, as we know, uh, uh, so for the human genome, uh, if uh, when the people did the comparative genomics, look at all of the vertebrates, find uh, roughly 5% of those uh, human genome are uh, very conserved. And we know uh, about the 1.5% of, of the human genome, uh, it's uh, coding uh, regions, which that means more than 70% of those uh, conserved region in the non uh, uh, coding region, that's uh, indicated how uh, regular elements uh, is so important. So we, we learned a lot about the comparative genomics using DNA sequence uh, about the evolution synaxion, uh, and where we see the similar pattern, a similar trace for the uh, evolution synaxion on the vertebrate epigenome. But there's uh, uh, some of the challenge, uh, uh, as uh, you can see, uh, so uh, when you do the comparative genome, you use the DNA sequence, it's a one dimension, but if you think about the epigenome, it's a really multi-dimensional of the uh, uh, information, basically involve the multiple tissues and multiple development stage, and, and then uh, also multiple assays, such as the chip uh, and the uh, high C and uh, ataxic, so involve a huge amount of the information need to integrate together. Uh, to understand uh, how the uh, conserved or uh, rapidly involved all those uh, regular elements uh, in the genome. So now I'd like to bring about, uh, introduce about the uh, FAN, it's a functional annotation of the uh, animal genome, so why it's needed and what, what's the major impact of these. Uh, so as uh, many of the study indicated, uh, those are the regular elements or functional elements uh, really less conserved compared to the coding sequence, uh, whatever between the species or between the different uh, tissues or development, different uh, development stages. And then uh, this is a comparative, uh, the FAN work really can help us to uh, understanding foundation of the biology. And then also, uh, especially, you know, uh, uh, when we work on the whatever human disease or the economic traits in the livestock species, uh, one of the most challenges is we have so many of the mutations, uh, variants, which one is a real costive variants. So this is the annotation of the uh, animal genome really can help us to uh, improve uh, the genomic selection accuracy for those uh, complex traits, including the disease. And then obviously, uh, for the scientists, uh, we really want to understand the molecular mechanism. Uh, so this will really help us to elucidate uh, the molecular mechanism of those uh, complex traits. And then obviously, uh, uh, many, uh, several of uh, already mentioned uh, how the uh, livestock species are really great model physiologically, and but also very important, uh, you know, uh, they're really great model for the human health and uh, disease traits. 
So like, uh, now I'd like to uh, provide a very brief information about uh, the fan. So in 2014, as if you look at it here, only uh, uh, roughly like 24 of the members contributed to uh, the white paper at that time. And then in the past uh, four to five years, so the member of the FANG uh, consortium already increased uh, to uh, 480 uh, members. And similar to the structure of the uh, ANCO uh, consortium, so we have a steering committee and also have a four different uh, subcommittee uh, the uh, Animal Sample and Assay Committee, and the uh, Bioinformatics Data Analysis Committee, and Metadata and uh, Data Sharing Committee, and a Community Committee. So all of those uh, four subcommittees really uh, work together, community, uh, communicated with uh, the animal genome community uh, to provide uh, the standards, the assays, and uh, so the community can generate more of the resource for the communities. Uh, so for this uh, fan community, uh, so we basically provide those uh, essential of the core assays. Uh, so obviously, RNA seq is very very important uh, as uh, it's a uh, it's a kind of the phenotype survey as a major phenotype of this, and then uh, chromatin accessibility uh, either use a DNA seq or uh, attack seq, and then this is a full histone modification mark. So if you look at it here, this is a full histone modification markers really can be used to identify either, uh, you know, enhancer or promoters or silencers. And then also the CDCF, uh, its uh, transcription factor can use uh, to identify the insulator. And here just to provide some of the preliminary analysis, uh, so uh, basically uh, we generated uh, uh, in the past few years uh, compared to the human and mouse with the data available, uh, so if you look at it here, uh, first on the uh, two uh, major uh, tissues, so the spleen and the liver, and uh, uh, we use, uh, you know, the H3K4 trimethylation and H3K27 acylation indicated as an uh, active promoter, and I use a H3K27 acylation and H3K4 monomethylation indicated as an enhancer. If you look at it here compared to all of the six species, in terms of number of the promoters and number of the enhancer, uh, they are pretty uh, similar to each other in terms of the number of these. And then, so here we did the, the uh, comparative analysis, uh, look at the, uh, called the sequencing conservation of in the promoters uh, uh, between the spleen and the liver. Uh, if you look at it here, basically, what does the sequence of conservation means? For example, if we look at the, the in the cow, we have 10,000 of the promoters, and we look at uh, for this uh, 10,000 of the promoters, how many of those uh, promoters, those are sequence are aligned in another species, but not necessarily there are active promoters. And you can see a number of these uh, are, are reasonable. So basically, among all of the mammals, they are similar to each other. Obviously, birds are much, much less conserved as expected. And then you will see uh, those uh, uh, livestock uh, aquatic species. So they are pretty, you know, comparable in terms of the, uh, their sequence uh, conservation uh, between the mouse and the humans and between the two different uh, uh, tissues are also very similar. And then if you look at the enhancer uh, sequence of conservation, it's the same thing, I use the number of the enhancer and then to look at it in other species to see what is the percentage of those enhancer so they have a sequence of uh, conservation, not the, the functional conservation we are talking a second. So, uh, for the sequencing conservation, probably you will notice uh, between the promoter and uh, the enhancer, they're pretty similar in terms of the percentage of the conservation. But if you look at uh, the functional uh, conservation, which means uh, if you look at uh, in the one species has 10,000 of the promoter or enhancers, and uh, how many of these in other species also it's an active promoter or enhancer, and you will see significant drop in terms of the percentage of these uh, conservation in terms of uh, whatever the promoter or enhancers between the, uh, uh, in the spleen here. So you will see uh, for the enhancer, the percentage of these are significant uh, less compared to the uh, promoters. And then, so uh, we also try to do in, in another comparison, uh, this is a, a final genetic tree uh, 
uh, across those uh, six species. If you look at it here, basically, we try to look at the compare every two of the species. They're near each other to see how many of those are conserved in terms of sequencing conservation. Uh, if you look at it here, uh, look at the across all of the mammals. Oh, sorry. Okay, so if you look at it here, across all of the mammals, so there, are, so there's a, a 48 to a, a 68 percent of these across the mammals are here. But if you look at the mammals, so between the mammals and birds, so only 26 to 45, and between the neighbor and the spring are pretty similar. And then, uh, so if you look at the functional conservation, and then you will see a significant drop. Uh, so if you look at the here, so you can see uh, across the mammals, uh, only like 11 to 24 percent, and then between the mammal and uh, the bird, only uh, 5 to 8 percent. Uh, so this uh, sequencing conservation versus functional conservation are significantly changed. Uh, same thing for the spleen. Uh, and if we look at uh, those, uh, what type of those uh, genes nearby for those uh, uh, promoters uh, for functional conservation. So you will see uh, uh, some of these uh, like BCL receptor signaling cell uh, cycling uh, across all of the mammals. And then if you look at it between the mammal and the birds, uh, you still see the BCL receptor and cell cycling and also the glycine cyrosine. Let's look at the spleen. If you look at the spleen, you will see the similar of these, the BCL uh, uh, signaling and uh, and then if you look at the, uh, the, between the mammal and also the bird, you will see similar of the pattern of the cell cycle and the BCO receptin. So we didn't see much of a, a difference in terms of uh, between the liver and the spleen. So they are seem like have the similar of the conservation uh, for the promoters. So let's look at the, the uh, enhancers. Uh, if you look at the, the enhancers here, so you will see uh, so in terms of the, uh, among all of the mammals, so it's the 48 to 100%. And then if you look at the, between the birds and the mammal, uh, it's a 26 to uh, 72, and similar to the spleen. But if you look at the functional conservation, you will see the significant drop. Only have a 0.4 to 1%. And if you between the uh, birds and the mammal, it's 0.04 to 0.1%. And, uh, and if you look at the spleen, spleen is uh, much, much higher, uh, but still pretty low. And then if we look at the function of this, you will see that for the liver. And then, uh, so this is the uh, uh, signal pass where we need it more of a liver specific. And then still you can see the like uh, atmosphere signaling. And then if we look at the spleen, you will see more of the, you know, the tissue specific, uh, uh, spleen specific involved more of the immune response, like a BCL receptor signaling, T cell uh, receptor signaling. And then, uh, and then uh, you will see here uh, the uh, chemkine the signaling. Then, then uh, so we, uh, we have a chance to look at across all of the uh, A uh, tissues. If you look at it here, you will see uh, between the promoter and the enhancer. Uh, obviously, you can see that within the mammals, it's higher than between the mammal and the birds, but also uh, between the promoter and the enhancer are significantly uh, uh, reduced. So here I'd like to provide another example for the opening chromatin in those uh, synthetic block. Uh, in the three of the examples between the chicken and the pig and uh, cattle, so you'll see that all appeared, all of those uh, three species. But these uh, uh, only appear to conserve between the cattle and the uh, pig and the cattle, but not as a chicken. And this is interesting. This is another example basically conserved between the chicken and the cattle, but not in the pig. And this is another example basically uh, about the tissue specific. You can see they're conserved between the pig and the cattle, but not in chicken. So some of the take home messages. Uh, as you can see, the sequencing conservation across the species versus pretty similar between the uh, promoter and uh, enhancer, but functional uh, conservation involved much, much faster than in the promoters. And it appears uh, the functional enhancer involved much rapidly in liver than uh, in the spleen, but not for the promoters. 
And then uh, genes nearby the functional uh, conserved enhancer are very enriched for those uh, tissue-specific manner, but not in the promoters. And then if we choose a species of those uh, appropriate of time scale of the conservation, we are allowed uh, to study uh, some of the specific of the constraints of the function. And then uh, those are the regulatory evaluation analysis really suggest that livestock uh, aquaculture species are a great model to understand uh, uh, the gene regulation in the humans. So I'd like to provide a few uh, uh, perspective in terms of the challenge and uh, the future direction. As uh, you know, uh, mentioned about the reference genome, uh, Eric's mentioned uh, how important and the quality of this. We consider a human mouse probably kind of tier one, and chicken, pig, and cattle probably tier two in terms of the quantity, and the sheep or horse probably tier three. Uh, so this is a very important in terms of doing the comparative genomics. And then, uh, the, especially doing the uh, map of the coordinates of those regular, regular elements uh, across different species are really, really challenge. Should we do in the secret uh, similarity or percent, uh, positional conservation? Uh, it's really, really challenge. And then, uh, so here I want to present uh, just a look at the sequence uh, conservation. And uh, uh, actually, for epigenomics, you need to look at the density of those uh, marks. We need more quantitatively to look at the how conserved uh, between the different uh, species, different tissues. And then also very important to understand, uh, especially the enhancer units far away from the genes, to understand uh, you know, which of the genes the enhancer really target to uh, understand functional elements of the, uh, you know, the promoter enhancer interaction. It's very important. And uh, it's, it's really, really uh, important to have a more of uh, uh, epigenomic data in more diverse of the species, especially a cultural species, uh, so we can understand uh, more of the uh, and can functional altitude of the animal genome to understand the biology. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of the people who contribute to all of those work here and uh, the funding agents from NIFA uh, and uh, industry. Thanks very much. So I think, again, since we're running behind Harris, um, we're not going to take any questions. <laughs> um,